God bless you all. You guys can hear me? Yes, amen, amen. Welcome, everybody. So I want to read something in the book of the storehouse. It will be in page number 21. Page number 21. I'm going to read something interesting there that can help us today with the topic of our offering. I'm going to read in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 2. It says like this. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up. As he may prosper, so that there will be not collecting when I come. Apostle Paul wrote that to the Corinthians. And he said, clearly, you guys have to put something aside before I come there. Does that mean that decision has to be made? He said, I don't want to come here and wait and do it like we used to do back in the days. Okay, we're going to collect the offering. We don't collect the offering. We should be done already because you put it aside the first day of the week. It should be done already. And the Apostle Paul said, don't wait for me to come here to you put something in the side. It should be in your heart already. It should be done already. Because God will put something in your heart to give and grateful of God. Because you are a grateful person. So Apostle Paul said, you should be done. Don't wait to set up, make it a part in the service to say, you know what? We're going to do offering now. This should be already done. Because you already put that part, that portion aside. And Apostle Paul said, listen, if you see me and I come to you and then you have to wait for me to offer something to God, you're wrong. We don't offer because we see the Apostle. We offer because we love God. Because we are grateful. Because God always provides for you. So don't wait to me or whoever is standing here to telling you to offer when that thing should be done already. That's what Apostle Paul says. So don't wait for me to see my presence to see, oh, I, I, today I see the Apostle, I'm going to give a big offering. Or I'm going to give a big tithe because the Apostle there. The Apostle said, don't wait for me. I don't want to do that. It has to be from your heart. It has to be you put him aside the first day of the week, and when I go there, that part is already done. It should be done already this morning. It should be done already. We don't have to wait for a part to decide what God put in our heart. It should be done already. That's what Apostle Paul said. So I hope the teaching you guys understand what Apostle Paul said. Put something aside. That way, when I go there, we don't have to collect nothing. Because it's already done. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks because we as a believer, we put it aside every first day of the week. Because we are grateful. Because you are an awesome God. You always provide for us, Father God. You always provide for us. Even in the tough situation. Even when we have nothing. You always there for us, Father God. And because we are grateful, we give you back what you give to us, Father God. Thank you. Thank you, Father God. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. Okay. Karen has to control me back there. It won't work up here for some reason. Good morning, everyone, or noon, or whatever time it is. I know it's still morning here in Missouri, but in several places, it's past morning. Um, wow, what a blessing. This is amazing to see so many people on here. Um, welcome, New Wine, and welcome all the new people on here. I see Shauna. It's nice to see you on here. 
I don't know who Catherine is or not 100% sure. Isabel, okay, nice to see you. Jada and Grandma Pat, it's great to have you on here. Um, anyway, we just welcome all of you in the name of Jesus, and we're just so glad to have you all here. So um, today what I'm going to be bringing is out of <clears throat> Acts 2 and 42. So that's our main focus on the scripture. Um, I'm going to read it, and then we're going to pray. So it says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And that's Acts 2, 42. And I just want you all to just open your hearts today and to receive what God is speaking. So we just come before you, God. We just surrender our hearts and our minds to you, God. We thank you that you want to speak to us. We thank you that you have a word for us today and that we are willing to hear what you have to say. God, we ask for fresh revelation. We ask that you would open up the eyes of our understanding, that we would hear you clearly today, and that we would um, reap from this word, God, that it would be a bountiful blessing for each one of us, God. I just thank you for every heart and every home that is um, represented here, God, and I ask you to bless everyone. I ask you to move mightily. I ask you, Holy Spirit, that you would minister and that you would be present, that you would make your presence known and that every single person would encounter you today and receive a blessing from you today. We just come into agreement for um, unity here and that we would all just receive your blessing and your favor that is upon us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right. So that scripture, um, I looked up the word devotion or devote, actually, because it said that that they devoted themselves. Right. So to devote means to give all of something and especially your time. Effort or love. Or yourself to something you believe in or to a person. It can also mean committed or dedicated, or faithful, steadfast, and true. Um, so I was looking at that, and they devoted themselves to the instructions of the apostle. And I was just, I've been um, really just marinating in this word all week, and just asking God to just teach me in it, you know, so that I can give what he wants to give. And <clears throat> he said, to give your all to something for someone, it takes real trust. And I think we all have that. We all know that when we give ourselves fully to something, it's not because of, you know, just uh, because we want to, it's because we trust that person. And so, you know, in order to give us fully to God, give ourselves fully to God, we have to trust. There has to be a trust there that we can truly be like, you know what, God, I trust you with everything and I'm going to give you everything. Um, <clears throat> so those believers were able to devote themselves to the ones God had chosen because they trusted Christ in them. So, you know, to trust a person is really hard, right? Because you don't always, you're like, oh, you know, they're, you, you're usually looking at their humanity, like they're going to mess up, they're going to disappoint me. But they were able to trust Christ in them. They weren't looking at their humanity, but they were looking at the Christ in them. And they knew, they obviously had the revelation of Christ not letting them down, right? That they knew that Christ wouldn't betray them. And therefore they were able to trust the Christ in them. And I'm just going to backtrack a little bit in like before this scripture is where um, Peter and the other apostles had like, it was right after Jesus got crucified and they had just won like 3000 people to the Lord. So it was right after Pentecost and all of this, like, everything had just went down. There was a bunch of new believers. And so all of these believers were like dedicated. They had really seen an actual miracle. They had seen moves of God and they had encountered the Holy spirit. They had just, you know, received a lot and they were confident in who God was, who Jesus was, who the Holy spirit was. And therefore they were able to submit and be um, they were able to devote themselves and actually know that what these apostles were bringing was truth. So it was just amazing to me how, like, I could just, I really could just imagine it. Like, they didn't, 
Like it was, they had just encountered Christ, right? They were just in a place where they were like, this is amazing. And we're going to, we know that these people are going to fail in their flesh. Like we know that they're going to let us down. We know that they're not a hundred percent perfect, but we know that Jesus is, and they could look past that. They could look past their humanity. They could look past the mistakes that they would make. And they could look past, you know, even the times that they didn't get it right, because I'm sure they didn't always get the word completely right. I'm sure they didn't always like their actions didn't always get it completely right. But they they were choosing to look past that and just submit to the Christ in them. And I was just like seeing that and imagining it. And I was like, oh, my gosh, what a beautiful place it would be if we were all all able to do that, because so many times, you know, in our pain and hurt and disappointments it's we can't see that you know it's it's hard to see that and so we we just shut ourselves off to christ in others and remember the pain that they brought to us so um devotion looked to them devotion looked like a humble surrender to god through his chosen ones <clears throat> it wasn't manipulation or control but an exchange of trust they trusted them because they seen them, you know, doing the acts of God with humble hearts. It wasn't, you know, with arrogance or with like manipulation and control, but they recognized Christ and they seen the love, they seen the humility, and that's what drew them, I believe. I mean, arrogance doesn't draw me in, so <laughs> I would not devote to that. <clears throat> So they were committed to receiving instruction from God's chosen. They were hungry to receive correction. And I received that because, you know, apostles are ones that are, gonna, are going in to bring order. And these were apostles, right? It was Peter and his tribe. They were there to bring order to the people and to bring correction. Is that it? What? Hold up. Give me a second. Oh, okay. Can you guys hear me okay? Everybody good? All right. Okay. So I'll try not to move my paper too much. <laughs> um, so anyway, on, on the apostles, they were they were coming in to bring correction, right? Like they brought in love, they brought in order, but they brought in correction and I just imagine like the, the people being hungry for correction. I don't think there's many of us that are usually excited to be disciplined or corrected or like receive instruction, even though we want to be doing what's right. But a lot of times when somebody, you know, is brings in correction, like our humanity wants to be insulted, you know, it's like, oh, that hurt. And now like, what if that was just their flesh? Like, a lot of times you can kind of pass it off and be like, well, they acted in the flesh, even though I know it was God, they acted in the flesh. And so I'm just imagining these, like these people, this whole group of people was all in agreement, all in one accord. And they were like willing to be corrected. They were willing to devote themselves to the teachings of the apostles and um, hear what they have to say and come under their correction, come under their, like, submit to them, <clears throat> and, you know, just truly devote themselves to that. And um, something that I really <laughs> was just, I mean, I was thinking about Peter and them, like, I know that they were tough, and I know that they probably, you know, you know they had to bring correction, you know they had to bring order. But the reality of the reason why these people could receive it was because they did it with love. And <clears throat> I'm sure that, you know, the people probably felt beat up. A lot of times you feel like beat up after somebody corrects you. But I can imagine that Peter and the others were like loving on them. I'm sure they, they like after, I, I was just thinking like after a beating, there's always a hugging and a loving. <laughs> and that's what, that's who God is. Like, he's not going to discipline us and not love us through it. Like he disciplines us, he chastens us, but it's always in love. And it's always, if we choose to accept the discipline, it's amazing what kind of love we can experience as he walks us through it, because he will not 
discipline you and then tell you, figure it out. He's going to discipline you and then lead you through it. And like, I've experienced that. And I've also experienced the time of just being disciplined and then just like, I can't do this, you know, like breaking down and being like, I don't know how to do this. And, you know, not actually receiving his love in it, but allowing it to take me down and out instead and feel like I'm failing. So there's two ways that we can take it. We can take it with love or we can take it with just the, you know, whatever. I don't know what this means. I'm just going to leave it. So I believe these people were willing and they were hungry for correction. Um, So it said all the believers. This was in the scripture before that. It said all the believers. So when we look at all, that's not just, you know, one or two of them. It's not just. 2000 of them, but it was 3000 plus it was all the believers. And to me, like this means unity. They were all in one. They were all in one accord and they agreed to be submissive, not some, but all of the believers. They committed to following. They committed to being submitted and to following what God was asking of them. And I I just started thinking about that. I was like, we don't know their backgrounds. We don't know who they were. We don't know their status, whether they were raised in religion or in freedom, whether they were raised Amish or Catholic or Pentecostal and everything else. And I was imagining some of them were probably elders. You know, some of them were probably pastors, leaders, young and old. I mean, we have no idea what kind of people they were, but they all came together and they chose to believe that what Peter and them were teaching was true. They all, like, I I was just imagining some of the leaders and the elders that had been teaching for years, had been trained for years, and all of a sudden they encountered the Holy Spirit. And they're like, oh my gosh, this is it. We've been doing it all wrong. And they chose to come under that, like, and just just like that, like, they were like, oh my gosh, this is is the way I'm going to choose to follow the Holy Spirit. And it didn't matter what they knew. It didn't matter what they had known beforehand. The revelation of Jesus is what was like, I I know nothing else. I'm going after this. So they all were one, all one accord. And to me, I was just like, oh my gosh, that's amazing. Because so many times, you know, we have that, but it's still like there's, there's people that are ashamed of not having done it right. And so they can't come like, you know, not experiencing the right thing, then then it's hard for them to come under and admit that they were wrong or admit that they need help or admit that um, maybe they've been doing it wrong and now God corrected them, but there's just shame and rejection there. And so it's hard to like submit to that. Um, So they received the revelation from God and allowed the transformation of the Holy Spirit regardless of their human reasonings, knowledge, teachings, understandings, degrees, or titles. They left all of that. They didn't care what they had known. They didn't care who they were. They didn't care who the other people were. I mean, even if the other, like, they weren't in the same religion. They weren't, there was young people, there was old people. They didn't care. They left it all because they seen God. They seen Christ. They had a commitment to God that attracted them to Christ in the apostles, apostles. And that was like very clear to me because it's like, you can't commit to someone and like the teachings that they bring, unless you have that relationship with God. And you like truly know that God is going to not let you down, that you truly know that you trust him and you can trust in his Holy spirit, trust in Jesus. And that, that relationship is what gave them the ability to trust in the apostles teaching. They had a revelation of Jesus that gave them the ability to trust his chosen ones to not mislead them. And they had a relationship with the Holy Spirit that gave them great discernment in the teachings. And I I just like to think, you know, the Holy Spirit is what my discernment is. I mean, there's many, many things out there that are, you know, we don't know if we can trust it. Right. And the Bible says, test the spirits. I am always always testing the spirits. And I'm like, I know the Holy Spirit is not going to lead me into anything that is not him. Like I know that the Holy Spirit is going to lead me the right way. So when you have the discernment of the Holy Spirit, when you trust in the Holy Spirit, 
you can trust that the Holy Spirit is going to discern for you and he's going to lead you the right way. So the next point was that they devoted themselves to fellowship and sharing in meals. So I read this somewhere and I want to share it with you guys. <clears throat> so think about a moment. Think a moment about the people you know and the relationships you share. Each of us is constantly enriched by family and extended family, friends and acquaintances. Beyond that, many of us have literally hundreds of other connections in the virtual world of social media. Simply put, relationships are the most important aspect of our lives. Our associations with those in the body of Christ are especially important. As Christians, we have become brothers and sisters in the family of God through the blood of Jesus. The Bible gives, gives these revel, excuse me, the Bible gives these relationships a special distinction between mere friendship. <clears throat> That's because bonds between believers are capable of developing a degree of spiritual closeness that far surpasses the limitations of natural human friendships. Christian relationships enjoy Christian fellowship. And that just really blessed me. I was so amazed by that. I was like, how could these people devote themselves to fellowship? You know, there had to be a real supernatural happening there because with over 3000 people and they were all devoted to the fellowship of each other. It wasn't just one person, but they were all developed or all devoted to the fellowship of each other. And that has to be something supernatural. It can't, it's not possible in just the real world. I mean, there's a lot of, it, with that many people, I mean, it's hard to get along with 10 people in a room, you know, without a supernatural connection. And so I just imagined like the supernatural connection that they had. And so I looked up what biblical fellowship is. <clears throat> And the word koinonia, I hope I'm saying that right, is a holy, that's, a, that's the Greek word koinonia, is a holy covenantal fellowship. It originates from the word koinono, koinonois, meaning partner, sharer, and companion. And it's a mutual cooperation in God's worship, God's work, and God's will being done in our midst. So that was their focus. It wasn't, you're doing it wrong, you're doing it right. What about this? What about that? Their focus was God's worship, God's work, and God's will being done in their midst. That was their focus. They weren't worried about what this person is doing, or if this person is going to get judged the way that he needs to get judged. They were more worried about what God's will was. And so they were focused on that. And that was the reason they had this connection. I'm sure they fought. I'm sure there were arguments. Like I, I cannot imagine that they did not have arguments and that there were times that they didn't get along, but their focus was Christ. Their focus was what is the will of God on the earth? What is the will of God in each one of our lives? What is the will of God in our fellowship? So they were focused on that instead of what everyone else wasn't doing right or was doing right. Um, so the word fellowship is derived from the Greek word koino, koinonia. And koinonia can be defined as holding something in common and is specifically used 20 times in the New Testament. Koinonia describes the unity of the spirit that comes from Christians shared beliefs convictions, and behaviors. When those shared values are in place, genuine koinonoa occurs. This fellowship produces our mutual cooperation in God's worship, God's work, and God's will being done in the world. Because of the importance of Christian fellowship, it is essential to distinguish biblical guidelines to govern our interactions with other professing believers. This is especially true in a world such as ours, at where there are where there exists tremendous diversity in the beliefs and behaviors among those who call themselves Christians. So they were all like that just made it very clear like it is extremely important to focus on the work of Christ, you know what God's will is, 
because when we're not focused on that, that's where diversity comes from. Like that's where division comes. That's where we start picking each other apart when we're not focused on the will of God and why the why of God, like, why is he wanting, why is he doing this? Why are we here? Like focusing on that part instead of um, what is wrong with everyone else. So in, as Christians, it's always important to find something in common in order to build a connection. And what they found in common was Christ. I mean, I'm sure they had other things in common. I have a lot of things in common with a lot of people, and that's a natural connection, you know. Um, it's easy to connect with people that you have things in common with. I think about Lou. She's not on here, my sister Lou. Me and her think a lot alike, and we connect so easily because, like, half the time she says what I'm thinking, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, get out of my head. So, like, you know, just that connection, that's a natural connection. And also, you know, a blood connection. We're, we're siblings. But there's a supernatural connection, and that's always Jesus. When we look at the supernatural connection, I think all of us can connect if we make the choice to. But the nature of us as humans is to find all the reasons and excuses why we can't connect. We like to look for the differences first. And I, I mean, I will admit to that. <laughs> I'm like, oh, come on. There's surely something there that we shouldn't connect, right? I mean, it's easy, especially, you know, when I'm, when I'm still in pain from a relationship before, or, you know, there's, there's things that happen in our lives. We all have pain. We all have trauma. We all have hurts. And so it's natural for us to look for the warnings first, instead of the reason why we could connect. And I'm not saying that it's wrong to look for the warnings because there are red flags, but what if we would first look to the connection of Christ? What if we would look first look to the connection of God and realize, you know what? We can connect. We can look past our differences and work through it that way. But yeah, anyway, so um, looking for reasons to not connect or excuses why we can't connect only opens a door of opportunity for the enemy to bring negativity. And I've definitely experienced that when I'm looking for the, you know, for the reasons of why I can't, it's like a negative atmosphere. It's a negative attitude. You're like negatively trying to find the reason why you can't connect. And that just gives, I believe that gives the en enemy an opportunity to speak about this person negatively when you're not committed to like seeing Christ in them, when you're not like, trying to find the good when you're not trying to find the reason of Christ in them. Um, so this one's a little tough, but it's truth and don't get mad at me. <laughs> the real reason is laziness because friendships, relationships take work. I mean, that's the truth. As much as you give to a relationship is as much as you're going to reap from it. So you say this person isn't paying attention to me. Are you paying attention to them? You know, it's, it's just like your relationship with God. Like, I don't feel like God sees me. Well, are you paying, are you spending time with him? Are you being intentional with your time with him? Are you hearing from him? Like, you know, excuses, sorry, but it's excuses and it's laziness. And I'm not sorry, sorry, not sorry. I should have said that because it really is laziness. And I've experienced that. I know that because I like, I've done it in my own life. And I know that the more that I sow into a relationship, the more that I give of myself in a relationship, the more that I'm going to reap from it. I've seen it with God and I've seen it with, you know, friendships in, in the earth, you know, just with my siblings, with just friends and whatever. Like I've seen it, I've seen it at work and I know that that's the way it goes. So the reason we don't commit to fellowship many times is because we're still blaming God for a previous relationship going wrong. Hard. I know. I, I have to admit that was my issue. I, you know, when, when a relationship goes wrong or there's a disappointment or there's pain, there's hurt, it's easy to blame God for it. And why have you not reconciled yet? Who are you blaming? 
because I'm pretty sure it's not the other person's fault. You can blame the other person as much as you want to. And it's, I mean, it's not hurting them. It's not hurting God. It's hurting you. So it's your choice. It's your choice to be freed from that. You can use every excuse and reason as to why not. But this doesn't change or affect a faithful God. It doesn't even affect him. It doesn't change him. He wants you to do that. He wants you to reconcile. He wants you to move past your hurt and your pain. He's not going to force you to do it, but he wants you to do it. So um, I believe those believers were able to look past each other's differences and share a meal. Um, it says that they shared a meal and the meal that they shared was the Lord's Supper. I mean, I'm sure they had, you know, food and fun. And then they also made sure to have the Lord's Supper together. And that's actually something that we're going to do after, after I'm done. So for those of you that weren't on our chat, um, we're going to have communion after this. So if you want to, you can go get it now or in a little bit, because we're going to do communion after this all together as a body. Um, <clears throat> but I thought it was amazing that they shared the Lord's Supper together, you know, to remember why they were connected. Because it says, you know, do this in remembrance of me. And they, they didn't choose to just, you know, be together and have fellowship and enjoy each other. But they chose to remember the reason why they could do it. They chose to remember the reason why they were able to all get along and not, you know, see past each other's mistakes and see past each other's um, humanity and and receive the like, see the reason why they got healed, see the reason why um, just why they were where they were at in their life. Like, I just <clears throat> think it was so amazing that they took the time to remember Jesus together. So they were devoted to remembering and honoring the reason for their freedom. They were devoted to the blood of Jesus and to the brokenness of his body and the promise of his salvation. So they took time to remember that every day together. That the reason they were where they were at was because of Jesus Christ. And the last point is, actually, no, I still have this on this point. So agreeing to this one hit me because I was like, you know, a lot of times it's easy for us to not get into argument or to like leave an argument or like, like walk away from an, a disagreement by saying we agree to disagree. And I don't like that. I don't know if anybody else doesn't like that, but I hate that when somebody says, we agree to disagree. I'm like, no. And I, this is what he told me. He said, agreeing to disagree is never going to resolve any issue. Agree to bring your disagreements under the blood and watch me work. And I'm just like, it's never going to work to agree to disagree. It just doesn't work that way. A lot of times I'm like, I know I was right, but <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Agreeing to disagree. I just can't like, you always just feel like, I just feel like a, a discomfort. Like, no, that's not right. That's not right. You know, it's not good for somebody to just say, we agree to disagree and just walk away from it. Like, it's okay that we didn't agree, but let's bring it under the blood of Jesus and watch him work watch what he does. And that means you're both willing to just, you know, what, this is my, this is what I think. This is what you think. Let's just bring it under the blood and let Jesus be right. You don't need to be right. He needs to be right. So that out there, it won't gain you anything or anyone else, anything. Jesus needs to be right. Always. Um, the last point is they devoted themselves to prayer and We've been talking about prayer, and last week on service, we had prayer. So we seen prayer in action, and I'm sure that we all know what prayer is, but um, I just wanted to bring this point out, and it says that they all devoted themselves to prayer. 
I think all of us have struggled with prayer, right? I know that I have. I'm definitely willing to admit that, that there's many times that I'm like committed for, you know, a week. And then I'm like, oh, you know, it's okay. Like I haven't prayed for, like actually prayed, prayed for like a couple days, but you know, it's okay. And then I get convicted and, you know, it's a struggle. It really is a struggle. It's something that needs a lot of discipline. And we've been talking about it. And for those of that were, that were in the prophetic class, we've been talking about it, like about prayer and the commitment to prayer and all of that. So a lot of us have been hearing that on prayer. I think God is really onto this for all of us. Like get on it, people. Get a clue that I want you to pray without ceasing. Um, but I would dare to say that these, follow, these followers, like all the believers, were committed to praying because they seen it in action. They seen the apostles praying, you know, they seen that it was important to have a prayer life. And that was why they were able to devote to that, devote to the prayer. I don't know about you guys, but I don't like being told what to do and not seeing it in action. You know, if somebody's going to tell me that you need to be doing this, then the way that I do it is by following what they're doing. And if they're not doing it, even though they said that you need to be doing it, I'm probably not going to do it because I watch their lives. You know, like some people that I look up to, I, I will probably, you know, I'll be doing what they're doing more than like, especially like if they're telling me to do something, telling me that it's biblical, but they're not doing it. it I'm just saying it's hard for me to follow it. So I don't know about you guys, but it is hard for me. Um, so prayer is not something that comes naturally. It is something that needs to be learned. Even the disciples that walked with Jesus every day knew that they weren't great at it and needed some training. They knew they needed training. They were discouraged, but they didn't give up. And I know for me, when I get discouraged, it's easy to give up. You know, instead of asking for help, it's like, oh, I'm just going to give up at least for a week. You know? <laughs> a lot of times it's easy for us to do that, you know. But these disciples, they were discouraged, but they humbled themselves and asked Jesus to teach them how to pray. They weren't, they were not going to get discouraged and just not do it anymore. But they seen their leader doing it. They seen, you know, that it was very important to pray to God. They, they knew the importance of it. And so they knew they needed it in their lives, no matter how hard it was for them, no matter how much effort it took, they were still willing to ask for help. And I'm sure they were ashamed. I'm sure they were like, why do we not get this? You know, like we suck at prayer. I know I, I, we say this all the time after you, I feel like I suck at praying, you know, and I'm sure they felt that way with Jesus, but they humbled themselves and they asked Jesus, like, teach us how to pray. So I have scripture for that in Luke 11, one, one day Jesus was pre praying in a certain place. When he finished one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. So I'm sure that you guys have a prayer life. Like, that's not what I'm saying. I'm pretty sure we all have a prayer life. Um, and I know that they all did. I actually just, I don't know if you guys have watched The Chosen. I know so, several of you have. But I just watched a season of The Chosen the other night. And <clears throat> it was where the disciples were all sitting around the fire. And they were discussing, like, what they knew before Jesus. Because at that time, they were walking with Jesus. And they were discussing about, like, how they how some of them practiced the Torah and they had the Torah down pat. Like they were like, you know, really good at this. And this person was really good at this. And, and the one was like, um, well, I thought I knew how to pray. And like, he was like, you could tell he was just so ashamed of it. Like, and then Jesus came along. Like I had no clue what I was doing until Jesus came along. And some of them were like, I loved, you know, I loved the rules. I loved following like everything that was laid down. And others were like, I love, you know, stepping outside of that. I love breaking the rules and, and just trying things that they told us that we weren't supposed to try. Like the one was like, I tried pork one time and then he got really sick. It was just, it was funny, but they were just having this discussion. And, and one of them was like, like, I literally did not, like, I thought I was praying. I thought I knew how to pray. And then Jesus came along. 
So the reality of it is, it's not like they didn't have a prayer life. It's not like they didn't know that God was their father and they were, you know, committed to doing what he was asking of them. But they, they knew that, like they had a real conviction and Jesus was pushing them to be, be better. They were walking with Jesus, right? And they were like, dang, we're not, we're not that good. Like we need to be taught and we need to be trained. So I just love how there was conviction there. And to me, I, I just, you need real conviction in, a, in order to have real transformation. So unless the conviction is really in your heart, then you won't actually change your life. Um, so there's a couple excuses that we like to use um, because, you know, so we don't have to pray. <laughs> um, and one of the really good ones is, that God knows my heart or that he already knows what I need. So why would I ask? I hear people say that all the time and it's a very easy excuse. I mean, yeah, there's scripture that literally says that God knows your heart, but there's also scripture that says that you need to ask. And I believe that this scripture is meant to motivate you to prayer and not give you an excuse out of it. So I, I don't really think that um, God, he's our father, right? A father that wants to speak tenderly to all of us, right? I don't think that he's going to give you an excuse out. I think he wants to hear your heart. I think he wants you to speak to him. I think he wants you to pray regardless of him knowing your heart, regardless of him knowing your needs, regardless of him knowing everything about you, because there is scripture for that. He wants you to ask him. He wants you to have that connection. He wants you to truly pray to him. Um, the Bible, I mean, I love the excuse where it says that, that God knows our heart because, yeah, he does know our heart. But the Bible says that our heart is deceitful above all and desperately wicked. So compare that and then say that God knows your heart. He does know your heart. Just saying. Um, so there's a lot of people that will not agree to this because, you know, a lot of times we're like, we don't, we don't have to compare our lives. Like, don't compare yourself. You'll feel shame. Don't compare yourself. You'll feel rejection. But it's not always a bad thing to compare yourself with somebody. Because if it's somebody that's walking with God, if it's somebody that's truly, you know, I mean, like, I, I want to compare myself to Jesus, right? So I can get better. And I believe that's what the disciples were doing. So comparing your life to someone else's is not always a bad thing. Learn to listen to the voice of conviction and silence the voice of condemnation by becoming better. So it's not always a bad thing to compare your life to someone else's. I know for a long time, I was like, I, no, I'm not going to compare my life to that person because I'm just, I'm just going to feel condemnation. I'm going to feel shame. I'm going to feel like I'm not measuring up or whatever, but it's not always a bad thing to compare yourself, especially if you use it to build, you know, to get better. So learn to listen to the voice of conviction and not to the voice of condemnation. The voice of conviction is going to be love. Um, if you don't know how to pray, humble yourself and ask. It's not that hard. Humble yourself and ask. Ask Jesus to teach you how to pray. And don't be afraid of asking your leader how to take steps to become better at this. It really isn't shameful. Like, I had to do that. It took me a long time. I, I didn't learn this overnight. It took me years to get where I'm at today. And I'm still not there. But I took the time to be trained. I took the time to listen, to humble myself, and to ask for help, and to be taught. The enemy would like nothing more for you than to give up your prayer life. He hates it when you pray. He is the one that brings the distractions and excuses when it comes time to pray. It's him you should be blaming, not someone else. Blame the enemy. You were created to have constant communication with your father. Don't allow the enemy to rob you from hearing the secrets of the father's heart. 
So that was the last point, but I wanted to bring this out. Um, in the next part of the scripture, it says that this is Acts 2, 43. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Everything in common. I believe that these three acts of devotion, they were devoted to the apostles' teaching, devoted to fellowship and the taking of the Lord's Supper, and devoted to prayer, right? I believe that these three actions of devotion is what brought this holy reverence, awe and wonder, and created an atmosphere for the Spirit of God to move. That is amazing to me. They were devoted to all of this, like they were devoted to what God was asking of them. And that gave an atmosphere and that they had many miracle signs and wonders. And the Bible says that, that these miracles were obvious. They were being talked about. Like, it wasn't just like, oh my God, did you know that I got a raise at work? That's a miracle. Like, you know, they were, I'm, I'm imagining there was people standing up from their wheelchairs. There was people getting healed every single day. Like I'm imagining there was amazing miracles happening every day because these were attesting miracles. And it was because of unity, you know, because of agreement, because of these people being together in, in one accord. Their commitment and dedication to God and each other brought unlimited miracles. I believe the miracles were unlimited. Loyalty to God and your leaders and fellow believers brings you favor both from God and man. That says it in the scripture there, if you were wondering. And the next part of it, I'm going to read the last part of the scripture. <clears throat> they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Can you imagine this? <laughs> I'm just like in awe. I'm like amazed by it. Like I was just imagining like if we were all in this type of agreement, this type of unity, num every day there were numbers being added. Every day lives were being saved. Every day. It wasn't every month. It wasn't every week. It was every day. So this radical devotion and the title of this uh, message is Rad true radical devotion and i believe that's what they had i believe that's what they're that's what they were doing they were so radically devoted to each other to god to the fellowship to the prayer they were just radically devoted um but this was saving lives every day and he said this devotion to me allows others to see that I am good in all things, in all things. Can you imagine our devotion to him, letting other people see that he's good in all things? Just our devotion to him is going to save lives. And also devotion to me will save others from complacency and conformity. That one hit me because I was like, just my devotion to him is going to save others from that pit. Because I think we've all been in that where we've been complacent, we've conformed, you know, to the things of what people want us to do or want us to say to the things that look right or seem right. But if we devote ourselves to him, our devotion to him is going to save others from that place. That's amazing. So that was all I have for today. And we are going to go into a time of communion and just really put into